Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter in Washington. Today is December 26, 1978, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 41. Yesterday my family and I were among the millions of Christians worldwide who were celebrating the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, and yet Christmas itself may soon become a thing of the past in America, because even as I say these words, the silent Bolshevik takeover of America is showing itself in drastic changes in church worship in many areas. In every possible way Jesus Christ is being removed from our minds, and ideas foreign to Christianity are being substituted in His place. At this rate it would not be long before Christmas itself is outlawed by the Bolsheviks, just as they did in Russia six decades ago. Meanwhile, the Bolsheviks in our midst are using the Christmas season to divert our attention from their satanic intrigues, just as they have done in the past. Economic manipulations are being set in motion to lead to accelerating stagflation here in America, that is, inflation combined with depression. Political maneuvering both here and abroad is setting the stage for Bolshevik dictatorship and soon Nuclear War I. Militarily, the Bolsheviks are pressing forward with feverish preparations to fight a war with Russia that will kill millions of us. For their part, the Bolsheviks also refuse to face reality. For them, America is fast becoming their last pasture to roam around in, and it is their last stand. They believe they must win here in order to wreak revenge not only on Russia which is expelling their kind, but also a Russia which has become a Christian nation once again. My three topics for this month are Topic No. 1, the economic countdown toward Nuclear War One. Topic No. 2, spiritual warfare and the collapse of trust. And Topic No. 3, Bolshevik maneuvering to buy time to rearm. Topic No. 1. A week ago on December 19, a million-dollar discrepancy in United States gold reserves made headlines. The New York Assay Office of the United States Mint of the United States Treasury is unable to account for at least 5,200 troy ounces of gold, and some say a lot more may be missing. The question is, how much more? My friends, nearly three and a half years ago in July 1975, I record AUDIO LETTER No. 2. At that time I gave just one documented example of how big the discrepancies really are. That example consisted of the January 20, 1965 gold shipment from Fort Knox to the New York Assay Office. The shipment came to more than one and three-quarter million ounces of gold, yet it was not shown on the official Treasury listing of Fort Knox shipments. My friend Mr. Edward Durrell forced the United States Mint to admit the shipment by confronting them with photographic evidence, and yet subsequent Treasury listings continued to omit that shipment as well as others. The simple truth is that the United States is gold poor. The official Treasury and Federal Reserve documents that list a huge United States gold hoard are totally false, as I have explained in detail in the past. The dollar has no backing and it is dying. My friends, on November 1, 1978, Jimmy Carter announced the Administration's plan supposedly to support the dollar. As part of this plan it was announced that the United States Treasury would increase the size of the monthly gold auctions from America's alleged gold hoard. Beginning with this month's auction on December 19, the amount of the monthly auction was increased to 1.5 million ounces. The problem is that there is no way for the Treasury to keep up this charade to fool the public for long. When the auctions began last April at 300,000 ounces per month, the United States had only around 6 million ounces available, mostly obtained from the International Monetary Fund and the Exchange Stabilization Fund, and even this small gold supply is not all in the form known as good delivery gold. The scheduled January auction will include melted-down foreign coins as one-third of the total amount to be auctioned off. Can you imagine? But some excuse has to be found to suspend the Treasury Gold auctions before the small gold supply is used up. The flap over a few thousand missing ounces of gold at the New York SA office could prove ideal for this purpose, 
or it could be that action will be taken in February by the Treasury to stop all gold sales because they have not stopped the decline in the value of the dollar here and abroad. Whatever the excuse, be warned. In the past I have explained in detail how the theft of America's gold was tied into the larger plan to deliberately destroy the United States dollar, and nearly three years ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 9 I described how the gold manipulations were used in March 1973 to force Europe to pay World War II reparations of $45 billion to the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, and their military partners. At this moment David Rockefeller & Company is in the process of extorting a second payoff of $45 billion from the central banks of West Germany, Switzerland, and Japan, but this time it is blackmail, pure and simple. And while it is being done under the guise of the so-called Dollar Support Plan of the Carter Administration, it is actually helping to hurry along the final collapse of the United States dollar. The alleged Dollar Support Program announced on November 1 includes as its most prominent feature a guarantee arrangement aggregating $30 billion by the United States Government alone. This is exactly the same arrangement as that suggested in speeches by David Rockefeller. Under this arrangement, the central banks of West Germany, Switzerland, and Japan each agreed to support the dollar by exchanging their hard currencies for dollars. In turn, the central banks can use these unwanted dollars to purchase United States Treasury obligations bearing high interest rates. But in addition, and this has not been made public before, each central bank is responsible itself for another $5 billion in support. The total currency credit package, therefore, adds up to a total of $45 billion. My friends, this has all been made to appear as a scheme to prop up the dollar but it's actually nothing more than a means by which the Rockefeller multinational corporations can unload unwanted dollars and receive in their place hard currencies. When the $45 billion in so-called support has been used up, as it will soon be, the dollar will be adrift again, even worse off than before. This plan is a bitter pill for Europe and Japan to swallow, but they are willing to pay the price for David Rockefeller not to rock the boat when the new European monetary system goes into operation on January 1, 1979. As I revealed nearly six years ago in my book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar, there are five Rockefeller-controlled multinational corporations which all by themselves can swamp the European monetary system. The companies are General Motors, Ford, IBM, Unilever, and Royal Dutch Shell. Their combined assets exceed those of the governments of Western Europe. Here is how the so-called Dollar Support Plan really works. First, a Rockefeller-controlled multinational, for example IBM, dumps $10 million in West Germany and demands the equivalent in Deutsche Marks, a hard currency. The central bank complies, buying the dollars and giving IBM the D-marks. But the central bank doesn't want dollars either, and so the bank turns around and buys United States Treasury obligations which bear high interest rates. This increases the national debt, and we American taxpayers pay the interest. So the Rockefeller multinationals get all the benefit while you and I pay the price. To make these Treasury obligations attractive to the foreign central banks, interest rates in the United States are continuing to rise. This is making the sick stock market even sicker and leading to a collapse in the real estate market by making homes impossible for most people to finance. That in turn is producing a downturn in construction with an increase in unemployment that will have a domino effect throughout our economy. So prices are accelerating while business is headed towards stagnation and depression. The result? Stagflation, as I warned in my book nearly six years ago. The long-range plan is right on track. And so the gimmick sold to the public as the Carter Administration Dollar Support Plan is really nothing more than a blackmail payoff and it is designed to help bring on a major depression in America. But the Dollar Support Plan is only half of the plan to produce a depression with inflation. As I have mentioned, this plan is having a strong impact on one of the two critical sectors needed to trigger a depression, namely construction. The other critical sector, my friends, is that of automobiles, and there too ominous developments are underway. In AUDIO LETTER No. 5 for October 1975, I referred briefly to the wise German economist 
whose information was misused in order to bring on the Great Depression of the 1930s. I studied under this man, and we became good friends. He was the one who taught me to look beyond effects to causes, and he explained in detail how the two critical sectors of automobiles and construction were manipulated to bring on the Depression. Today the same scheme that worked then is being brought into play again. Last month on November 7, General Motors gave the first signal of impending trouble in automobiles. On that day General Motors announced a cut by one-half in the dividend rate on GM stock. It was GM's way of saying hard times ahead, and the stock market shivered and went into a slump. At that time there was no apparent reason for the GM dividend cut since automobile sales this year have been good. But, my friends, those who control General Motors know what lies ahead, because cars run on petroleum energy, and as part of the chain of events leading to Nuclear War I, manipulated oil shortages are on the way. Throughout the 20th century oil has been a dominant factor in economics, politics, and war. As I've detailed on past occasions, World Wars I and II were both fought over oil. In World War I it was Saudi Arabian and Russian oil, and Christian Russia was all but consumed in the flames of Bolshevik Revolution. In World War II it was Saudi Arabian oil again, and this time the back of the British Empire was broken. It was also about Chinese oil, whose attempted development by the Japanese led finally to atomic fireballs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Today Nuclear War I is fast approaching between Russia and the United States. This time it is different in one respect. This time it is to be a grudge match. On one side are the Christian sect who have taken over the Kremlin after a struggle of six decades. On the other side are their overthrown deadly enemies, the atheistic Bolsheviks, who are rapidly seizing total control over America. But even in this situation energy continues to play a major role. To the Russians, control of nearby sources of energy is a prime consideration influencing their diplomatic and military strategy. To the Bolsheviks, oil is a tool of intrigue and economic conquest as well as a trigger for war. To understand the real significance of the OPEC oil price increase announced on December 17, it must be viewed in this light of Bolshevik intrigue. Because, my friends, what has just taken place is not what it appears to be. Saudi Arabia has now been lured into a trap. She is to be both scapegoat and victim in the economic chaos of warfare our rulers are now bringing down upon us all. The giant oil companies of the Rockefeller Cartel will use the OPEC oil price increase as an excuse to reap tremendous windfall profits. As the American economy falters, Public bitterness against Saudi Arabia will be whipped up. At the same time, Saudi Arabia will be blamed for destroying the Camp David Accords between Egypt and Israel. Increasingly we will be told that the United States must disengage and disconnect from Saudi Arabia. Events will deteriorate in the Middle East, with Saudi Arabia being made to appear even more sinister. Finally, it is all to culminate in the American-Israeli limited nuclear strike against Saudi Arabia's oil fields. It's all part of the elaborate American strategy for a nuclear first strike against Russia, which I revealed in detail four months ago. So for both economic and military reasons, our rulers were determined to bring about a substantial increase in OPEC oil prices. To accomplish this they have applied a triple squeeze on the OPEC countries. The first element of this triple squeeze is the declining value of the United States dollar. Once America's rulers began to actively debase the dollar, the dollar in effect was on strike against the OPEC countries. OPEC oil was being paid for in cheaper and cheaper dollars, causing the real income of the OPEC countries to decline steadily. In addition, the value of dollars already held by OPEC countries has been evaporating before their very eyes. Yet in spite of all this, OPEC oil prices were kept frozen for the past two years, and it was Saudi Arabia that prevented any price increase from taking place. The second arm of the triple squeeze on OPEC lay within OPEC itself. 
Agitation to raise prices was led by Venezuela, which came under Rockefeller control long before World War II. At the same time, the CIA agents within the OPEC structure made sure that OPEC would continue to base oil prices on the dollar. Our rulers wanted to have a visible connection between oil prices and the value of the dollar for propaganda purposes. What OPEC will finally be forced to do, my friends, will be to abandon the dollar within the next six months and begin pricing oil in terms of a basket of foreign hard currencies. But for now, our rulers have forced OPEC into continuing to price oil in terms of shriveling dollars. So now the predominantly Arab OPEC countries have been trapped into appearing to be the cause of the dollar's decline, inflation, and the coming depression here in America. The third and final arm of the triple squeeze against OPEC involved the actual triggering of the price increase. Some way had to be found to undercut the leverage and influence within OPEC of Saudi Arabia long enough to force a substantial price increase. This was accomplished by means of the recent rioting against the Shah of Iran accompanied by drastic cutbacks in Iran's oil production. The recent trickery involving Iran has been very successful in fooling almost everyone, and yet what has just been done is one of the oldest tricks there is. To illustrate that, let me take you back for a moment to the spring of 1962. At that time tremendous riots were taking place in Greece. They were being labeled as Communist-inspired in the press, and likewise secret CIA reports were saying that a virtual Communist takeover of Greece was well underway by means of these riots. Ex-President Harry Truman, though long out of office, was still very actively interested in the policies of the American Government. Also, Truman had always worried about Greece due to its strategic position on NATO's southern flank. Through the Marshall Plan and other means, he had done all he could to keep Greece strong and pro-Western. When President Truman read all the stories and CIA reports about Communists rioting in the streets of Athens, he became very worried. But Truman was always suspicious of the CIA, feeling that they were feeding him half-truths. He considered Greece to be too important to depend on the probably slanted assessment by the CIA, and concluded that totally independent intelligence was needed on Greece. And so President Truman contacted his close personal friend, Robert Kennedy, who was then Attorney General. One of the things on which Truman and Kennedy saw eye to eye was their distrust of the CIA. Both were convinced that the CIA was actually serving a different master, and of course they were right. After conferring with Truman, Robert Kennedy contacted George Docking, the former Governor of Kansas who had become a key director of the United States Export-Import Bank. In turn, Docking contacted me and asked me to set up the intelligence mission to learn the true situation in Greece. At that time I was legal counsel to the Export-Import Bank but my true function was very often the gathering and analysis of intelligence under the imposing cover of the Export-Import Bank. And while we were at it, President Truman wanted us to deliver a personal message to the Greek leaders. They were laying plans to erect a statue to Truman for his great help in keeping Greece in the Western camp after the war. He appreciated the thought, but he had made clear in rather salty language he did not want any statues. As a cover for the intelligence mission to Greece, we concocted an XM Bank mission to Austria, Greece, Turkey, Lebanon, and Spain. The story was that we were checking up on various projects where XM Bank loans were involved. On April 18, 1962, the XM Bank Travel Group, which included Governor Dockin and myself, left Washington. After visiting all five countries, we finally arrived back here in Washington on May 1. The official report on the trip ended up at 46 typewritten pages. Tucked in, almost lost among all the words, was only one page about Greece. That single page contained only one statement of true significance, and it had nothing to do with the rioting which actually prompted the trip. This statement was, quote, Mr. Zolotis was particularly concerned about the steady decline in the gold reserves held by the United States, unquote. Mr. Zolotis was an official of the Central Bank of Greece, and his actual words were a lot more emphatic. He said to me that if he did not protect the gold reserves of Greece, quote, my people would hang me, unquote. But the real information sought on the trip had been the matter of the Greek riots and their origin. 
That information was contained only in a secret report which I delivered personally to Robert Kennedy. What I had done in Greece had actually been very simple, in spite of the elaborate cover we had to use for the mission. I went out and mingled with the crowds of demonstrators. Posing as a businessman from Lebanon, I asked what the rioting was all about. Was it Communist-inspired? The answers were all the same. Nonsense, they said. The government itself is putting out the story that it's Communist-inspired. You see, that way America will give them more money than to Turkey." Unquote. The information which I obtained in this way turned out to be much more accurate than that given Truman by the CIA. As we all know, Greece did not go Communist, and today few Americans even remember the Greek riots of 1962. In the same way, the riots in Iran have been orchestrated so as to create the image of a threat to accomplish a given purpose. That purpose was to provide an excuse for a drastic cutback in Iranian oil production that would help trigger an increase in OPEC oil prices. CIA-directed funds were channeled into support for the rioting in Iran, but this fact was camouflaged by CIA reports beforehand that foresaw no threat to the Shah. The famous November 11 memo of Jimmy Carter which criticized the CIA for failing to foresee the rioting in Iran was only part of the cover tactics to allay suspicion. In the weeks before the OPEC oil meeting, the crisis atmosphere surrounding Iran was assisted by certain American multinational corporations. They began evacuating personnel from Iran, and this was played up very big on television. We saw people flooding into airports at Athens, Tel Aviv, Rome, Paris, getting out in a hurry from Iran. At the same time, remarks by Jimmy Carter added to fears that the Shah was doomed. On November 30 he said, quote, we do not have any intention of interfering in the internal affairs of Iran, and we do not approve any other nation interfering in the internal affairs of Iran." Unquote. And in further statements on December 1, December 6, December 7, and December 12, Carter continued to contribute to the crisis in Iran by refusing to publicly back the Shah. Thus the United States appeared to be deserting him, and the crisis continued to build in Iran. Meanwhile the oil flow from Iran was cut to a trickle. The other members of OPEC were put under an enormous and expensive strain in an effort to take up the slack. For weeks before the OPEC meeting in Abu Dhabi this was the situation. The result was to pull the rug out from under Saudi Arabia. On December 17, just nine days ago, an OPEC oil price increase of 14.5% was announced to occur in four stages during 1979. As planned, everyone was shocked at such a large increase, but the following day Sheikh Yemeni, Saudi Arabia's oil minister, said on the BBC World Service, quote, with the situation in Iran, the price of crude went up sharply, and we were not able to argue so much inside OPEC against an increase like this, unquote. For now the turbulence in Iran has served its immediate purpose of triggering a large OPEC oil price increase. But the pressure, my friends, will be kept on Iran to keep OPEC in line. The recent artificial turbulence in Iran has been a preview of things to come. We have now been provided with a careful demonstration of how vulnerable Iran could be and how vital her oil supplies are to us and the world. And when the time is ripe, we will be reminded of these things for war propaganda purposes. In AUDIO LETTER No. 37 four months ago, I detailed the secret American first strike strategy to initiate all-out nuclear war with Russia. Under the plan, the Camp David Accords between Egypt and Israel are to be shattered in a way that will lead to the nuclear destruction of Saudi Arabia's oil fields. Already the Hate Saudi Arabia campaign is building up in America's controlled major media. As for Sadat, he has placed his hopes on President Carter. But in AUDIO LETTER No. 38 I revealed that Carter had suddenly contracted leukemia and cancer in the left side of the head. I must now reveal that the cancer has begun spreading to other areas of his body. This is the truth behind the recent cover stories about his hemorrhoid problem. And on Saturday, December 23, Carter secretly returned to Washington from his Christmas trip to Plains, Georgia. He was here for cobalt treatments at the Bethesda Naval Hospital. My friends, in AUDIO LETTER No. 38, 
I explain how Jimmy Carter's involuntary departure from the scene is intended to help ignite war in the Middle East. Now those events are drawing closer by the day. Topic No. 2 Nearly two months ago, in late October, Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko paid a three-day visit to France. On October 28, Gromyko held a press conference at the impressive new Soviet Embassy in Paris. Symbolically, the Embassy is located next door to the former headquarters of NATO from which France withdrew years ago. In his press conference, Gromyko said that his visit had, quote, confirmed the privileged relations, unquote, between France and Russia, and he added, I want to stress the word privileged, unquote. My friends, what Gromyko was talking about was the unique position of trust that now exists between France and Russia. It all began long ago when General Charles de Gaulle as President of France began to see the handwriting on the wall. On one hand, the United States was becoming increasingly devious and untrustworthy in its dealings with other countries. On the other hand, de Gaulle learned that something was taking place in the ruling circles of Russia, something that was gradually making Russia worthy of at least cautious cooperation. De Gaulle was determined that France should be strong and independent. So in a very cautious way he began to develop the relations between France and Russia as a counterbalance to the powerful influence of the United States. Gradually the process expanded to the mutual benefit of France and Russia. Meanwhile, American policies in both diplomacy and defense continued to deteriorate. As the United States became bogged down in the quagmire of Vietnam, it became obvious that we were not even fighting the war in a rational military fashion. The French, for their part, had learned their Indochina lesson at Dien Bien Phu in 1954. For this and other reasons de Gaulle concluded that the United States had become unreliable as a military partner. France, he decided, must go it alone. So in the 60s de Gaulle pulled France out of NATO. The NATO headquarters building in France was closed, and NATO moved its headquarters to Brussels, Belgium, where it remains today. In taking this action, de Gaulle repudiated American leadership in the defense of Europe. He also signaled a truly independent attitude in foreign policy and defense. The door was open to increased dialogue and cooperation with Russia. Since that time, the ties between France and Russia have grown steadily. There has been a historic affection between France and Russia that dates back to the time of the Tsars, and today it is being restored again through cooperation in all kinds of areas. Nearly a year ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 32 I revealed the Franco-Russian intrigues in Canada. For the French it is intended to lead to French domination of Canada. For Russia it is expediting preparations for the invasion of the United States. But there are other areas of cooperation between France and Russia which are much more visible yet generally not recognized for what they are. For example, the French are contributing heavily to the instrumentation carried to Venus by the Russian Venera series of space probes. In the realm of military technology, France is participating with Russia in the ongoing testing of charged particle beams in space. And last spring, when France carried out neutron bomb tests in the Pacific, Russia raised not a word of protest. By contrast, the American neutron bomb is the target of intense Russian propaganda. Yet all of this does not mean that France has become a secret satellite of Russia. Quite the contrary. France is continuing to pursue a foreign policy rooted in her own interests and as a result French action sometimes calls Russia great irritation. And Russia, for her part, is not above applying intense pressure on France whenever it is necessary. But even in areas where there is not agreement between France and Russia, there is an atmosphere of basic understanding. The situation was summarized in the article distributed by the Soviet Embassy in Paris before Gromyko arrived there in late October. It was titled, Moscow-Paris and Axes of Détente, 
It praised relations between France and Russia as a model of peaceful coexistence between states with different systems, and it noted that their differences, quote, will continue to predetermine a certain non-coincidence in the positions of the USSR and France in foreign policy, but the things which unite them are more important, unquote. My friends, the unique factor tending to unite France and Russia today is trust. Wherever there are specific commitments between the two, there is trust that neither side will double-cross the other. It is this atmosphere of trust that is missing between Russia's rulers of today and the rulers of America. As Gromyko said in a toast in France, quote, France practices a policy of détente without zigzags, unquote. By implication, he was saying that others, especially America, cannot be trusted. And so when Gromyko called the relations between France and Russia privileged, quote, unquote, he was talking about a matter of trust, and the benefits of that trust can hardly be overstated. In AUDIO LETTER No. 36 last July, I mentioned Southern France as one of the areas that should be spared in Nuclear War I. I can now reveal that Russia's campaign of nuclear sabotage has now been extended to Europe. It is by no means as extensive as that which has been carried out in America, which I first began to make public in AUDIO LETTER No. 23 for April 1977, but as of now almost every country in both Eastern and Western Europe has now been mined with Russian Cobalt bombs in key major cities. Russia's intention is to use these bombs as blackmail. She wants to force Western Europe to stay out of the coming war, and she wants to fend off the revolutions in Eastern Europe which the Roman Catholic Church, dominated increasingly by Bolsheviks, is trying to bring about. Of all the countries of Europe, only one has so far been completely spared of all sabotage by the Russians. That country is France. In all of the other countries, Bolshevik influence is great enough that Russia does not feel able to trust them completely, but where France is concerned, the element of trust is more powerful than nuclear weapons. My friends, lack of trust is the real reason for America's coming catastrophe in Nuclear War I. There was a time when the United States of America was respected and honored for keeping its word with other countries, but that time is long gone. The atheistic Bolsheviks who are seizing control of America favor intrigue over honor and deception over truth. As the Nationalist Chinese on Taiwan have just found out, years of solemn promises and guarantees by the United States no longer mean anything at all. The only way Nuclear War I could be prevented, my friends, would be for the Satanic Bolsheviks to be thrown out of their positions of power here in America. Russia today is controlled by Christians, and if America were once again controlled by Christians, trust could be established. But the Christian Revolution, which has been taking place in the ruling circles of Russia, is not being repeated here in the United States. Instead, the atheistic Bolsheviks are using the guise of Christianity itself in order to attack Russia. Four months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 37, I revealed that Bolshevik influences within the Vatican were preparing to throw the Roman Catholic Church into the Bolshevik War against Russia. Two months later I explained how Pope John Paul I had run afoul of this game plan and what had happened to him as a result. I also pointed out the tangible evidence which was available to prove my charges of deceit and fraud within the Vatican. And now the real Pope John Paul II has also fallen by the wayside contrary to appearances. As I explained in AUDIO LETTER No. 39, Karol Cardinal Watiwa of Poland was elected Pope because the Bolsheviks wanted to make use of his anti-Communist image in their war against Russia. But as Pope John Paul II, he also had a flaw which the Bolsheviks could not tolerate. From the moment he became Pope, Watiwa made it clear that he intended to shake up the Vatican bureaucracy known as the Curia. Initially he did not reconfirm any top officials of the Curia. 
He merely asked Cardinal Villot of France to stay on as Secretary of State quote, until other decisions have been made." Unquote. Through these actions and other statements, Pope John Paul II made it clear that he was planning to completely restructure the Curia. Any such restructuring, my friends, would have dealt a serious blow to Bolshevik power within the Vatican, for it is through the Curia that the Bolsheviks now exercise their Vatican control, and their key agent, Giovanni Cardinal Benelli, is one of those who would have been replaced in a Curia reshuffle. But the Bolsheviks had known that Cardinal Vortiwa as Pope would try to change the Curia. As Archbishop of Krakow he had often spoken in favor of such restructuring, so when he became Pope they were already preparing to make sure he did not carry out his plans. When Cardinal Watiwa was named Pope on October 16, 1978, it was only his anti-Communist image that the Bolsheviks wanted. Watiwa himself was a strong-minded man, not the type that usually makes a good puppet. And so even before his election, Watiwa's unacknowledged replacement was being prepared. For the first few weeks of Pope John Paul II's reign he was kept busy with public appearances. On October 27 he began his shake-up of the Curia by firing a veteran Cardinal, Cardinal Felici, as President of an important Vatican Council, but his heavy schedule of public activities tied his hands for moving rapidly on the promised reforms. Then in mid-November the Pope virtually dropped out of sight for a time, but on November 21 the Vatican released an announcement that was as brief as it was stunning. As of that date Pope John Paul II was said to have confirmed in their posts all the top Curia officials who had served the previous two Popes. Without explanation we were told in effect that Pope John Paul II had undone his own plans for Vatican reform. My friends, here is what actually happened. During the period in mid-November when Pope John Paul II was seen very little, his poisoning was in process. Beginning November 18, this took the form of a very powerful airborne poison based on plutonium and zirconium, a variant of the poison that produces Legionnaire's disease. The Pope's condition deteriorated rapidly, and he died at approximately 4 p.m. Rome time on November 20, 1978. Shortly thereafter his body was secretly removed from the Vatican, being taken first to an interim location about 45 miles northwest of Rome. By 8 p.m. Rome time the following evening, November 21, his body had been cremated. It was earlier that same day that the Vatican issued the terse announcement saying the entire Curia had been reconfirmed by the Pope. Since that time an actor has been playing the part of Pope John Paul II. This man is neither Polish nor Christian. Those in Europe who have more opportunities than we in America to see the Pope should observe him closely. Pay close attention to the voice, the mannerisms, the closeness of the photography. Compare the pictures of the dead Pope and this actor and the exact nature of his public utterances. These days the actor Pope is the most visible Pope in history, made so by the controlled major media, and his pronouncements are moving the Roman Catholic Church closer and closer to open confrontation against Russia. My friends, in AUDIO LETTER No. 39 I explained how the satanic fraud surrounding the death of Pope John Paul I could be proven. Now their fraud has taken the life of another Pope, and 700 million Catholics are gradually being called to arms in the cause of Bolshevik warfare against reviving Christianity in Russia. Topic No. 3 Last month I devoted AUDIO LETTER No. 40 to a detailed explanation of the gruesome events which had just taken place in the Republic of Guyana. As I explained then, the Jonestown tragedy was a mass murder, not a mass suicide. It was staged in order to provide access to Guyana for a military operation, a commando raid to wipe out a secret Russian missile base. The base was the same one about which I had begun warning over four years ago in the summer of 1974. It was basically an American operation, 
but with heavy participation by the Israelis because of their unparalleled experience in such operations. And when I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 40 last month, I was able to report that Jim Jones had not died at Jonestown but had escaped. The body identified by the FBI as that of Jones was that of a look-alike, a double. Jim Jones had followed an elaborate escape route which ended up in Israel on November 30, the same day I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 40. Jim Jones was alive, my friends, but he was not well. It is time now to finish the nightmare story of Jim Jones. When Jones arrived in Israel he was suffering from cancer in his head, in his left lung, in his stomach, and in his colon. After an intelligence debriefing near Jerusalem, he began receiving cobalt treatments for the cancer in his head. The treatments began on December 4, but they did not last long. The following day Jones was told that it would be necessary to transfer him to another location where more comprehensive treatment could be given for his advanced cancer. So shortly after 5 p.m. Israeli time Jones boarded a small airplane with a doctor and three other men. The plane headed northwest toward Turkey and then inland along the border between Turkey and Syria. At about 35 miles east of the town of Jerobolus on the Euphrates River the plane crossed briefly to the Syrian side of the border. At that point the door of the plane was thrown open and three men grabbed Jones. In his weak condition and caught by surprise, he was thrown out of the plane with almost no struggle. Meanwhile Dr. Lawrence Schack was making his way to Israel, unaware of the fate that had befallen Jones. Unlike Jones, Schack had been an Israeli agent from the beginning and now he was returning home. But just as with Jones, the FBI has been used to give false reports that Schacht died at Jonestown. It was Schacht who prepared the cyanide poison mixtures which were administered, some orally, some by injection to the Jonestown victims. The cover stories about Schacht in the controlled major media of the United States have generally given him an idealistic image but a Jonestown survivor who worked for Schacht in the Jonestown Medical Department paints a far different picture. She has been quoted as saying, He was a sadist. He liked to see people in pain. He didn't do anything to relieve pain." Unquote. On the day when Jim Jones was thrown out of an airplane over Syria, Dr. Schacht was making his way to Paramaribo, the capital of Suriname. Just before noon Washington time, December the 9th, he left Paramaribo by jet across the Atlantic, taking with him a large amount of gold. His route took him to Conakry, Guinea, Bamako, Mali, and across the corner of Egypt near Wadi Halfi, Sudan on the way to the Red Sea. At approximately 3 a.m. Israeli time, December 11, Dr. Shack arrived at Jerusalem. Dr. Shack was afflicted with cancer in his head and throat, and like Jones, had been promised the best in treatment for it upon arrival in Israel. But Shack was given only a brief examination near Jerusalem, and then told that it would have to be moved to another location for better treatment. There was no need for a long debriefing of Shack, since Jones had already told everything there was to tell. And so, barely an hour after his arrival at Jerusalem, Shack was in the air again in a small plane with four other men. Three and a half hours later Dr. Lawrence Shack met his end as Jones had done six days earlier falling from the skies to a lonely spot along the Turkish-Syrian border. My friends, it's hard for most of us even to imagine such diabolical and cold-blooded activities as these, but sadism and disregard for human life were the hallmarks of the Jonestown mass murder, and in the end those who sell their souls and their country for gold always pay the price. As I mentioned last month, Operation Guyana was successful in wiping out the Russian missile base there, yet this will have very little impact now on Russia's ability to pulverize America in Nuclear War I. What it did accomplish was to buy a little time for our rulers for the coming war and to help throw the Russians off balance. Our rulers are also now trying to buy more time to put off Nuclear War I by a few months by establishing full diplomatic relations with Red China. In their feverish attempts to rearm the United States in preparation for war, 
they are willing to do almost anything that will buy a little more time. Crash military programs are secretly under way, but even crash programs take time to bear fruit. The ruling circles in Red China are well aware that our own rulers cannot do without Red China as an ally against Russia, and so three months ago on September 19 they applied pressure tactics to force full recognition by the United States. On that date, as I revealed that month in AUDIO LETTER No. 38, a secret agreement in principle for a secret alliance was signed between Russia and China. But the Chinese leadership is far from united unlike that of Russia, and while the Hua faction wants to side with Russia, the rival faction headed by Deng Xiaoping wants to go with America for a while. China can dictate tremendous concessions by the United States, but can dictate nothing to Russia. And so the ink was hardly dry on the Sino-Russian Agreement of September 19 when it was used to panic our own rulers. As September 19 followed the sun around the world from China to America, news of the Sino-Russian secret agreement was flashed to Chinese agents here in America by the Dong faction. That same day, September 19, our rulers were confronted with the reality of this agreement, and they were told that it could be undone only if two things took place. First, the Dong faction must be assisted in overcoming the faction headed by Chairman Hua. Then to consolidate Deng's power and China's allegiance to the United States, full diplomatic relations must be granted between America and Red China on China's terms. The major media, while they have not explained all this, have drawn attention to September 19 as the critical day. For example, an article in the Washington Star on December 16 said, quote, In the fall the talks entered a new phase. On September 19, the Chinese Consul in the United States visited Carter in the White House, conferring with him in the Oval Office." Unquote. The next day the Washington Post said near the end of a long article about the China decision, quote, By this account the crucial United States decision was taken September 19, two days after the euphoric end of the Egypt-Israeli summit meeting with Carter at Camp David. Unquote. Soon the Great Wall poster battle erupted in Peking. Dong was making a bid to upset the power of Chairman Hua, and he succeeded, and as the war of words died out, Washington prepared feverishly to announce full diplomatic relations with China. That announcement on December 15 was the third major surprise handed to Russia by our rulers in less than a year. The first was a Korean airliner intelligence mission into northern Russia last April. The second was the Battle of Guiana last month wiping out the secret Russian missile base there, and now Red China. But one has to ask, where is all this really leading? On December 15, the day of the Red China announcement, there were only six Russian Cosmospheres on patrol over Red China, but less than two days later 105 Cosmospheres have taken up their positions there. All Cosmospheres are equipped, among other things, with exotic lighting equipment for nighttime psychological warfare. The Chinese, robbed of all religion by their godless regime, are prime targets for such tactics. Who is to say how millions of Chinese might react if 100-plus Cosmospheres began haunting the night skies of China, flashing and hovering at low altitudes? In any case, our rulers cannot hope to do more than buy time with China. To achieve that, they are even willing to bleed off some of America's productive capacity in building up China. With whatever time that will buy, they hope to improve their readiness for war by concentrating on secret weapons. The surprises dealt to Russia during the past year do prove that Russian intelligence, while it is very good, is not perfect. They can be surprised. This fact is not lost on the Kremlin either and they are preparing some surprises of their own. I mentioned last month that geophysical warfare is high on the list of probable techniques to be used by Russia in retaliation for Guyana, but I can now reveal that the Russian Navy has removed the seven gigaton rage super bombs which had been planted around the Philippines when I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 24. The Philippines, the only Christian nation in Asia, has now come to terms with Russia. 
This is true even though the United States may continue to use the huge Clark Air Force Base and the Subic Bay Naval Base there. With the new Russian Cosmos strategic weaponry, these bases are no longer so important. Instead, the Russians are reinforcing their network of Cobalt bombs along America's west coast itself. As of my latest report on December 20, there are now 46 bombs planted where they could devastate Southern California. Along the California coast, eight are above the 36th parallel of latitude, four above the 35th parallel, twelve above the 34th parallel, and ten above the 33rd parallel. There are nine more between the 33rd parallel in California and the north end of the Gulf of California, which contains three more bombs above the 31st parallel. Some of these bombs are at sea. The others are generally underground in caves and mine shafts where they can help to trigger a massive earthquake. It remains to be seen how soon these capabilities will be used, but one thing seems clear. The United States has now had three strikes against Russia, the Korean airliner incident, Operation Guyana, and now Red China. Any hope for trust on the part of Russia is gone, and now it is Russia's turn at bat. On the evening of December 17, just over a week ago, the CBS television program 60 Minutes devoted its lead story to the Particle Beam Weapons Race. The program pointed out the potentially decisive importance of Particle Beams and the fact that Russia is far ahead in this field. Within minutes my telephone began ringing. Fifteen months ago when I first revealed Russia's operational status in Particle Beam Weapons, they were being ridiculed. So at that time many people paid little attention to what I revealed, but now colors were saying, quote, Do you see what's on television? You were right." Unquote. My friends, I warned long ago about the false wisdom called wait and see. Now those who have chosen that course have waited, and now they are beginning to see. If we keep waiting, my friends, we will get to see it all and we will all believe on the day that television programs are interrupted by a surprise announcement that NUCLEAR WAR ONE has come. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.